You said some things that made somebody else mad. No big deal. That's pretty much just an average afternoon on Twitter. But you don't live in the age of Twitter, you live in the 1200s, and the people you made mad are really upset by what you said. So upset that the authorities believe you should never say anything again. Now a man in a leather apron and a black hood approaches you as you sit strapped to a chair, unable to move. He yanks your mouth open and brings a set of red-hot pliers to your mouth. If you've watched the news or read the opinion section of any newspaper, you're probably aware that people are very protective of their free speech. But while in modern America the right to free speech is protected by the First Amendment, other societies throughout history haven't been so lucky. While these days making off-color comments might run you the risk of getting cancelled on Twitter, in less enlightened times crimes such as blasphemy, speaking out against the state, or even just gossiping too much could result in you having your ability to speak permanently cancelled in real life. In other words, we're back with another one of the worst punishments imaginable, and this time we're going to show you all about the history of tongue torture. Lick your lips real quick. Trust us, you'll be grateful for it later. Ritual tongue mutilation has been around seemingly as long as people have had tongues. In Mayan culture, the tongue was a common place to draw blood for use in rituals. Mayan tongue mutilation was usually self-inflicted and practiced by community leaders and other members of the upper class. The ritual involved piercing the tongue and pulling a barbed cord through the resulting hole. This tongue-twistingly painful act might sound like a form of torture, but amazingly this was mostly commonly practiced as a form of minor human sacrifice to commemorate the birth of a child or the completion of a construction project. Yeah, that's right, instead of cutting the ribbon at the dedication ceremony of a new library or block of apartments, a Mayan town mayor would have sliced his own tongue open. The Code of Hammurabi, which was written in 1754 BCE, making it the earliest known set of written laws, mentions tongue removal as a punishment for a number of crimes. As we mentioned in our episode on scaphism, many ancient justice systems operated on a principle known as lex talionis, or an eye for an eye, and Hammurabi's code is the prime example of that. Among other gruesome punishments, the code stated that under Babylonian law, spies would have their eyes removed, and those who stole another man's slaves would be branded, and doctors who caused their patient undue loss of life or limb would have their hands severed. Basically, Hammurabi's law took let the punishment fit the crime to its logical extreme, and in his defense it'd be hard to be a repeat offender for theft or surgical malpractice when you don't have any hands to steal things or do surgery with. So, naturally, instances of tongue mutilation mentioned in the code were punishment for crimes that involved speaking. The complete removal of the tongue at the base was called for in cases of perjury, as well as in cases of adopted children publicly rejecting their foster parents. You might be thinking, tongue removal isn't such a bad deal, especially when compared to removal of the hands or eyes. Sure, you wouldn't be able to communicate with anyone without carrying around a stone tablet and chisel, and you wouldn't ever be able to enjoy the taste of your favorite Babylonian-style kebab ever again, but other than that, you'd still be able to live a full life, right? Well, you have to remember that understanding of medicine back then was hardly what it is today. While the Babylonians understood the importance of sterilization to stop the risk of infection during surgery, and their surgical techniques were relatively advanced for the time period, they still hadn't quite nailed the recipe for foolproof antiseptic. Even though you'd survive the initial tongue amputation, there was still a high chance of dying later from an infection. Tough break. The story of tongue mutilation doesn't stop there because as time went on, it remained a popular form of torture, and torturers only got more creative with the ways they chose to go about it. Torturers throughout history kept the theme of Lex Talionis going, more often than not preferring to go for the tongue in cases of blasphemy or heresy. Cutting out a prisoner's tongue was the preferred form of lingual mutilation in the Middle Ages, and torturers used a variety of grisly tools to get the job done. The mouth would be held open and the tongue would be clamped in the rough iron grip of a device simply known as the tongue terror, which would then be tightened with a screw to ensure a vice-like hold on the victim's tongue. Sometimes the tongue was merely held in place and stretched out so that it could be severed using a sharp knife. Other times it was used on its own to roughly yank the tongue out of the prisoner's head. Another version of the tongue terror had interlocking zigzag teeth on the clamp, like pinking shears, which would shred the tongue to ribbons as it was being pulled out. Other methods of tongue torture included boring a hole through the organ with a red-hot iron. This method was used on a Quaker man named James Naylor who, after reenacting parts of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, was arrested for blasphemy in 1656. Part of Naylor's punishment was not to only have a hole bored through his tongue, but also to be branded with the letter B, 
for, as you can probably guess, blasphemer. Nailing a prisoner's tongue to a table was another practice from around that same time. Now, if you think that sounds a lot worse than the way it was done in the days of Hammurabi and his code, you'd be right. For as little as the Babylonians knew about preventing infection, the people of medieval Europe knew even less, not even bothering to clean their tongue clamps between uses. The risk of infection was extremely high, but if you were lucky, your torturers might kill you themselves, saving you from a long and painful death from infection. While removal of the tongue was the go-to punishment for blasphemy, there were other less fatal forms of tongue torture for crimes that were considered less serious in nature. The Skold's Bridal, also known as the Gossip's Bridal or the Branks, was a supposedly more softcore form of punishment saved for British women who had committed the unforgivable crimes of cursing, nagging, or gossiping to a degree that members of the community considered riotous or troublesome. It was also sometimes used on suspected witches to stop them from being able to recite spells or curses. The Skold's Bridal was first recorded as being used for legal punishment in Scotland in 1567. And while it may or may not have ever been legal in England, its use was also recorded there around the same time period. The device was a large metal cage placed around the head with an iron plate attached to the inside that would be forced into the wearer's mouth, sort of like a low-tech version of Saw's infamous reverse bear trap device. The iron plate, known as a curb plate, was spiked and studded on the bottom in a way that would cause minimum pain if the wearer kept their mouth completely still, but it would shred the tongue if the wearer attempted to speak. Once the device was applied, the scold would be paraded around and often beaten in public as both a form of humiliation and an example to other women. To add insult to injury, the outside of the mask was sometimes decorated with features like donkey's ears or pig noses, personalized to fit the exact kind of troublesome woman who was forced to wear it. An eavesdropping busybody might get a scold's bridle made to resemble a rabbit, while a lazy woman might get one that looked like a cow. Who would have guessed that the 16th century was a little backwards in its views on women's free speech? In the English town of Walton-on-Thames, there's still a Skold's Bridal on display in the vestry of the church. It's dated to 1633 and accompanied by the following inscription, Chester presents Walton with a bridal to curb women's tongues that talk too idle. According to the local story, a man named Chester lost his fortune due to a local woman's gossip, and out of spite, he donated a Skold's Bridal to the town jail, specifically so it could be used on her. The Skold's Bridal remained used as a form of official punishment in England until as late as 1856. While it wasn't nearly as common in the New World, African-American scholar and abolitionist Alada Equiano described seeing a similar device used in a way to control slaves in 18th century Virginia. Elsewhere, outside of Europe, tongue removal was also used as punishment in parts of Asia, and the practice features in a story about Kana, a medieval astronomer, poet, and folk hero from Bengal. When she presented her research to the king, he was so impressed that he requested her presence in the royal court the following day. Kana's father-in-law, a fellow astronomer by the name of Varahamahira, was so jealous that he ordered his son to sever Kana's tongue. In many versions of the story, Kana's husband refuses to go through with it, and the tongue removal is done by either Varahamahira himself or a hired hand. In others, Kana cuts off her own tongue to save her husband from having to hurt her. Regardless, all versions end with Kana being rendered tongueless. Her story is still told today and has been frequently discussed by feminist thinkers in modern Bengal. In fact, many examples of historical tongue trouble have a gendered element to them. Backtracking a little bit to ancient Greece, stories of women suffering acts of tongue terrorism are a common theme. Philomela, an Athenian priest, was sexually assaulted by her brother-in-law Tereus, who later butchered her tongue when she threatened to name him for his crime. According to legend, however, Philomela still got her revenge, as she was able to embroider Tereus' name into a tapestry that she then gave as a gift to her sister Procne. Procne, realizing her husband was the one responsible for attacking her sister, got revenge by killing her son and serving him to Tereus for dinner. If this story sounds familiar, it might be because it served as inspiration for a plot point in Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus. Another Greek story of tongue mutilation is that of Timica, a Greek soldier's wife in the 6th century BCE who, when captured and faced with interrogation by enemy forces, chewed off her own tongue to ensure she would be unable to give up any information. According to the version of events recounted in Iamblichus's Life of Pythagoras, once Timica had sufficiently mangled her own tongue, she spat it out at her would-be interrogator. While this wasn't an example of tongue mutilation being used as punishment, we still felt we had to give Timica a shout-out, since she sounds like she was tough enough in the face of danger to make diehards John McClane look like Paul Blart Mall Cop in comparison. Fast forward to modern times and you might think that the days of tongue mutilation as a form of punishment are long gone. 
Unfortunately, due to tongue mutilation's unparalleled effectiveness at stopping people from talking, the practice has survived in some isolated pockets well into the 20th and 21st centuries. Survivors of Canada's infamously barbaric residential school system, an initiative designed to forcibly assimilate Aboriginal children into Western culture, recount that a common punishment for being caught speaking in their native tongues was to have their tongues pierced with needles and in extreme cases shocked with electricity. These punishments happened as late as the 1950s, when the residential school system was finally disbanded. Possibly the most notorious example of modern-day tongue violence is the Colombian necktie, an execution method that was invented by political terrorists during the Colombian Civil War of the 1950s, but made famous worldwide by drug kingpin Pablo Escobar in the 70s and 80s. The name refers to the practice of cutting a large, deep, horizontal slit in the victim's throat, then pulling their tongue through the resulting gap, like a flesh-blood-stained necktie. It's a horrifying way to go with a gruesome aftermath, making it a highly effective intimidation tactic. Even more recently, in 2007, Iraqi insurgent Mohammed Sulaiman was taken from his house and had his tongue cut off when his superiors caught wind of his plans to defect. Sulaiman was taken to the nearest hospital by his attackers, who told doctors he'd been in an accident. Three days after returning home, Sulaiman found a package on his doorstep which contained both his severed tongue and a note warning him against ever trying to speak up about insurgent activity again. So next time you're doing anything from voicing your opinions to licking stamps to enjoying your favorite flavor of ice cream, be grateful you weren't around in any of these times and places, as if you were, well, you probably wouldn't have much to say about it. Don't let this video leave you tongue-tied. Tell us what you thought in the comments, then go check out the Blood Eagle, Worst Punishments in the History of Mankind, and the Catherine Wheel, Worst Punishments in the History of Mankind.